Looks like we're doing it and uh, happy to be here. And welcome again to the Resonance Academy's six weeks of uh, overview of the Unified Science program that we have made available for anybody to go through for free. And uh, my name is Marshall Lefferts. And as a, maybe most of you know, but some of you are new here, I'm a member of the faculty of the Resonance Academy and a board member of Resident Science Foundation. And um, we're going through the six modules of the Unified Science course that is available at the Resonance Academy. And you go to resonancescience.org. And I'm here today with Nassim Haramain, who is RSF's founder and director of research. And as well today, we're joined by Olivier Adderall, who is a research scientist working with Nassim on really <laughs> absolutely groundbreaking theoretical developments of, uh, based on the holographic mass solution, which is the foundation of Nassim's theory. So um, before we have an intro from you guys, I just wanted to say, again, this is a, a six week series that's being offered to provide an introduction to the course and for Nassim and Olivier today and myself to share about the subjects of each of the six modules of the course. We're going through one per week and this is the third week. Um, and we're excited to say that we have over 6,000 people that have signed up for this series, uh, the six week series and over 18,000 people have signed up for the course. And that's just super exciting for us. Um, and today we're going to, to share an overview of module three of the course, which is called Modern Physics. Um, and we'll dive into that in a moment. But before we go there, I just wanted to welcome the Sim to the webinar and have you say a quick hello. And then I can make a little intro into the what the module covers in the Sim and we can take it from there. And later on, we'll take some Q&A from you guys as well. So um, the Sim, welcome. Hi, thank you. It's great to be here with you. Uh, uh, today is going to be fun. Uh, Marshall, you look like you're like in a wormhole. I am. Uh, behind <laughs> you, it's like a square wormhole. It's kind of cool. Yes, uh, it's very one of a kind. <laughs> yeah, one of the kind. Yeah, exactly. It's a magic mirror. <laughs> so um, we uh, we're gonna we're gonna tentatively approach the uh, the uh, repu reputable and formidable mm -hmm. module three, you know, <laughs> which is the place where many people kind of like trip over uh, physics. Uh, and, uh, you know, some people find it challenging. Um, and uh, I think it's really uh, exciting because it really, um, I, I believe personally that people find it challenging because we are in that module uh, discussing the history of science, uh, the history of physics mostly, but, um, you know, and the, some of the approaches that have been taken in physics, the assumptions that were made, and uh, some of the dissonance <laughs> of the standard approach to physics, you know, which is normal. It's, it's okay. We, we evolve as we evolve and we grow as we grow. Um, and, you, and it's really important for us to understand where we're coming from, to understand where we want to go and where we're going. Uh, and that was the concept of that module was that uh, the student would um, get at least a minimum base education on um, some of the big parts of the standard uh, physics theories that are out there, but as well, some of the not so well known or uh, not so well understood history of physics and um it's great to have Olivier with us uh <laughs> for that part and um you know the uh the history of science uh is not so well understood and I'm talking about not only 
it's not so well understood. Even people have majored and written books about the history of physics, um, like physics historians. Um, you find in many of those writings, either their papers or their books, that they didn't quite understand the physics that were developed uh, or the context in which the physics were developed, meaning that, um, you know, the his typically the historical uh, context is overlooked. Um, the, um, um, the, the cultural context is overlooked. Uh, the pressures that were felt at certain stages of our evolution by physicists to, you know, go in a certain direction or in another uh, due to cultural context, due to historical context, due to um, uh, societal pressure and, and financial pressure and all kinds of things that in that made physics evolve a certain way. And in order to understand that, you have to have very deep um, understanding of the physics themselves. And, uh, and although people may think that, um, you know, a physicist, phys first of all, physics, very wide field, there's, you know, from astrophysics to you know, quantum theory, relativity, like, um, you know, um, uh, astronomy. I mean, like, there's a lot in physics, but as well, um, you know, so, and there's many specialized parts of physics uh, that don't communicate well one with each other. Um, there's as well, a loss of knowledge that's occurring from generation to generation, um, which is causing some issues. Um, uh, for instance, uh, the general public might think that an astrophysicist uh, understand Einstein field equations well, understand relativity well, uh, and that relativity is well understood not only in terms of people understanding it, but as well in terms of, you know, describing in details many components like mostly gravity and electromagnetic fields. Um, and the same for quantum theory. You might think that quantum theory is well understood, that, you know, it's consistent, uh, that, that it, it, you know, they, that, that uh, uh, quantum theorists understand all of the branches of quantum theory and so on in details. That's just not the case um, because there is such a compartmentalization uh, in our physics. Um, there, you know, most physicists understand very specific things very well and typically not the rest very well at all. Uh, so you can imagine that in the context of understanding the history of physics, um, you know, it, it's even a larger problem because now you got to now not, not only understand the various theories and the details of them, but you got to understand them in the context in which they were conceived of and how they were brought about. Um, so for instance, it's very, very difficult to, to find physicists that have a very in-depth comprehension of relativity uh, from one end to the other, and that's comfortable with all of its aspects. Or somebody that has a very deep understanding of quantum theory and um, you know that can go from quantum field theory to you know, string theory or you know, um, the standard model of particle physics and so on uh, in one big swoop and you know, uh, understand the deep level of details and their historical context in which they were built. So we tried in module three, I know this has been a long winded uh, introduction. We tried in mod module three to really give you just like 
And although people feel like, oh my God, I just hit a brick wall with all these physics and details, we really try to give you an overview of the historical context in which these theories were built, namely mostly the two prevalent theories or you know, mechanics as well, the three prevalent uh, theories that makes up our world of physics and where they got those ideas, how did they, they, they got to where they are in those ideas and um, the disconnected, you know, kind of like uh, confusing result that comes out of it that, that, and, you know, I say that frankly, you know, that doesn't just confuse the public, that confuses the physicists as well. Um, and this is why, and more than ever now, like, uh, you know, 20 years ago, looking for a unified field theory was thought to be, you know, not necessary. And if you were working on it, or I would say more like 25 years ago, 30 years ago, it was thought to be arrogant because if Einstein couldn't find a unified field theory, uh, how could you even imagine you would? But um, now it's like there's a huge push to try to find, I mean, something much more comprehensive. And, um, and that's because the new generation of physicists, like my friend over here, right, are kind of tired they're just not gonna go along with like, just calculate and don't think about it. Um, you know, they wanna understand, they wanna understand well, they can see that there's huge gaping holes in the, in the standard approach uh, that, you know, is leaving more questions than answers. And uh, they wanna push past all this. And so there is a very big, um, push now for unifying physics and uh, Olivier and I in the last few months have completed the holographic mass solution to all of the fields and all of the scales so we're very confident that we've done that and we're excited to bring that to the world but um, let's look at module three. <laughs> <laughs> Great thanks Nassim. Great introduction. Uh -huh. um, yeah this is very foundational, not only to understanding the historical context and the current primary concepts and theories that are underpinning physics, but as well, there are aspects of this that really are important to understand when it comes to then learning about the unified physics model, the holographic mass solution, and uh, understanding how it, it's in direct relationship to some of the current theories that are, that are you know, correct and accurate, and then are extended by unified physics theory. So it's really a very foundational aspect and it can be a little challenging. I'll share my screen and we can take a quick look if you want at, um, yeah, is in module three. Okay. And here we go. I'm gonna get these zoom windows out of the way so I can see what I'm looking at. Yeah, so here's module three, modern physics. And I wanna just uh, remind everybody again, it's not, this is not a class in module three, this is an introduction. And it's not a requirement that you've studied module three to be in this session with us today. Um, take your time, especially this one is, is a, there's a lot of information and it goes very deeply into some subjects. Um, and it's, uh, it's important foundationally, as I said, so um, after the introduction of the setting the context of why to go into this review of modern physics, um, the first section is covering the, the overall concept of reductionism as an approach to problem solving in science and in physics in particular, and uh, reviewing Descartes and Newton uh, and his contention of uh, Descartesian thinking the idea of a flat universe, uh, et cetera, laying that foundation of the reductionist approach and how that's informed and in some ways challenged our capacity to, to really go deeper into the physics. Um, then a, a study in the idea again, another fundamental premise of 
science, um, especially in physics, is the idea of the closed system, which Nassim talked about quite a bit last week as well, uh, and how that relates to energy, the laws of thermodynamics, entropy, etc. And then a overview and review of Einstein and the relativity revolution. And so the nature of light and special relativity, the mass energy equivalence of e equals mc squared, gravity and Einstein's general theory of relativity, black holes. This is very foundational stuff actually to understanding the unified physics model as well. And just to, to note, it's, it's not that this gets super technical in this module. It can in some instances go there, but um, it's, it's uh, meant to be more to provide the overall conceptual understanding. And then the last section is on quantum theory. What does quantum mean? Black body radiation and the ultraviolet catastrophe, which is a kind of what originated the understanding of the quantum uh, aspect of the universe. The Planck units, this is very important to understand in relationship then to how that applies to unified physics theory. The birth of quantum theory, the Copenhagen interpretation, which I know in the sim and Olivier may comment on that as to how that in some ways constrained the thinking over the past hundred or so years in physics that um, uh, maybe caused a little more challenge than it needed to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then quantum electrodynamics and quantum field theory and the vacuum catastrophe, et cetera. And then uh, a, a look at the standard model and um, there's many aspects of it here. I won't read them all again. So that's the main topics of this module. As you can see, it, it really covers a lot of ground and it's very um, important to understand the, the premise, the theory of modern physics, how it has informed and successfully informed the pursuit of physics and the understanding of, of the nature of the physical aspects of the universe, as well as the ways in which it has essentially kind of gone off in directions that have posed more challenges because they aren't necessarily going to answer the questions. They're some of the big questions that until now have not been able to be answered because this model had its limitations built into it. Uh, and which Ms. Sim and Olivier can talk to about how that's so, as well as how uh, some of those and many of those big questions are being answered through the unified physics model. So that's the overview and- um, Yeah, and we have William Brown online as well, I think. Did William so, join us? Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, so William can uh, William pick some questions as well. Hi, William. Sharing. <laughs> you there, William? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm here. I'm just uh, here, I guess, to uh, offer any kind of support. Okay. We uh, discuss some of these topics. I appreciate to have for you all, there. For all the questions we can't answer, we always throw them to William. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> always here as a fallback. So <laughs> just throw William under the bus. Yeah. <laughs> Nissim, I saw one message that some people said it was a little hard to hear you. I don't know if you want, want to pull your computer a little closer to you. Oh. Um, um, okay. Um, but just be aware of that and maybe you and Olivier can speak up a little bit. Okay. Is this better? Can you hear me better now? Oh, yeah, it sounds better to me. I didn't even realize okay. that was your voice. I thought it was somebody else. <laughs> yeah, yeah right it seems it. to be a lot more more present and clear. Great. Okay, great. So, um, um, yeah, I would say, Nassim, a good place to start is that this, this module is intended to provide both a foundation of understanding that is then useful and necessary to go into the unified physics in, in module four, sure. as well as to highlight some of the problems in modern physics that are um, really persisting to pose challenges in the ability to solve and under solve problems and understand you know greater uh, more more so the nature of the universe um, and so mm -hmm. do you want to just begin by talking a little bit about that aspect of the 
importance of this module? Yeah, so basically, you know, these principles that were developed early on uh, have a lot of merit. Um, they have got us to where we are um, and they, they allow us to do very important calculations, for instance, you know, for planes to fly, for your cars to work, for your phones to work, for, you know, all kinds of things we do. Um, and they're important. Uh, some of the aspects we're going to discuss today is that, um, however, it has, ha it has reached limitations. And it's reached these limitations because in some cases we've made models, but then forgot that we made a model. So we came to conclusions uh, from these models and assume that this is truly how the universe works, where in fact, um, it's the answer we're getting from the theory is only based on the fundamental axioms are these models that we set um, on our way to developing the theory. And because the reason why it's not so obvious to physicists is because the models might have been created by somebody else Almost a hundred years ago, the theory had hundreds of people, if not thousands of people contribute pieces of it, you know, along the way. And so it's like, it's like the root, um, the, the root bios of a computer, you know, that's buried under, you know, thousands of plugs in plugins you know uh, if if people remember uh the problem of y2k uh where you know uh mainframe computers of banks and governments and all this were running a root directory or a root software that had a problem with uh spinning out um uh dates past 2000 um, you know, but but there was some serious issue to go in there and edit it because it was under, um, you know, I don't know how many updates of codes and plugins and all kinds of stuff on top of it. And actually ac accessing the root uh, software was, you know, very complex and almost impossible in some case. And so... Um, uh, it was eventually done properly uh, by most of the banks. Um, my cousin actually helped out with one of them, Morgan Stanley. But, um, you know, this um, and Y2K was a non-issue as a result, but uh, it, it required some serious dedication and some very strong attention that is not necessarily obvious to the average physicist currently, right? Yeah, and uh, an interesting example is with the Newton and th uh, theory. The Newton theory was able to, to predict pretty well the, 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 the functionment of the solar system with the, all the planets. And the first patch was made by Einstein with the uh, relativity theory explaining. Olivia, I'm sorry, you're going to have to move closer to the mic. I'm getting oh, lots of people yeah. saying they can't hear you. <laughs> all right. Oh, okay. Let's start over. Yeah. Can you hear him better now? Yeah. Can you, well, yes. oh, so I, I was seeing um, an example of that. Uh, it's the Newton theory, which was uh, with the gravity, which was able to, to predict the, the functionment of the solar system with all the uh, orbital. The functionment uh, is a French word uh, uh, with an English accent. <laughs> um, it would be the mechanics of our solar system. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the, the first patch to this theory well, was made by Einstein with the general relativity and with the prediction, for example, of the Mercury orbits. But we saw that expanding this, this nice model to the world universe may, uh, may uh, make more, more make evident that the model wasn't enough with the, uh, some issue. And uh, they tried to solve this issue, for example, with dark energy and dark matter. Mm -hmm. So just like with, uh, with uh, Newtonian earlier um, uh, gravitational theory, 
Einstein patched it. And now when we use Einstein for the whole universe, we have issues where we're missing 96% of the mass. And the current patch is to invent a new kind of matter and a new kind of energy that is conveniently impossible to detect <laughs> because it's dark. And I call that the dark ages of physics. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and it's a patch that's not very appealing uh, even to many physicists, finally, you know, early on, everybody bought onto it. Uh, and because it sprung out a whole new industry, I mean, you got to think about physics is as well an industry. And if you have a theory that all of a sudden says we need to build, you know, billion dollar instruments to detect dark matter and dark energy, um, well, you know, you get billions of dollars from governments to go and salt mines and you know build detectors and it it gives a lot of work to a whole lot of physicists and so it's a good thing uh and then so because physics is an industry um it has a tendency to go in certain directions that have financial interest isn't that true yeah there, there is some kind of politics yeah and so we will call it some kind of politics and so basically um that can create um distortion um but i mean because of the failure in finding any dark matter particle anywhere at any time any place in the universe we've looked um, finally, uh, in the last few years, physicists have been starting to think maybe we need a better theory than uh, patching 96% the mass of the universe with dark matter and dark energy. Uh, maybe the problem is not that we're missing mass. The problem is that the theory we're using is incomplete. And, um, you know, so people have been starting to look at ways. Now, we published papers uh, on the cosmological constant. cosmological constant, which is the, the constant that's describing the expansion of the universe and the mass of the universe and all this, and in which we use the holographic mass theory and show that we can account for all the mass of the universe including what they call dark matter and dark energy with our theory without needing you know to um have some kind of fudge factor about some kind of matter that you can detect um and uh so basically we're showing that the equations are correct and to put it like in a very sustained sus uh sustained way sus no two french people trying to speak english uh, uh, succinct. Su succinct. I can never say that. Succinct <laughs> way. Um, you know, the paper basically showed that if we apply the holographic mass solution or straight up, you know, the Schwarzschild solution to Einstein field equation appropriately to the universe, that is considering all of its mass, um, in the case of the the Schwarzschild solution. In the case of the holographic mass solution comes out normal, it comes out naturally from the equation. Um, the universe obeys the condition of a black hole when uh, the universe is considered in, the, con in uh, the condition of a black hole, it has the correct mass. And that is because the vacuum, the quantum vacuum fluctuation of that black hole have to be considered. That is, the space in the universe is not empty, it's full of energy, and you have to consider that energy when you consider the mass of the universe. The whole equation of physics that describes the universe is explaining that to physicists, it's showing that to physicists, but they've not understood it yet. And so there are, they're starting to. So Nassim, would you say that what you just described that the, the energy that's contained in what's typically called the the vacuum the empty space which mm -hmm. is has it was and as explained in module three that was removed from 
the premise of the whole theory in order to basically get it, do away with the, the problem of infinities that kept showing up. Uh, exactly. when, you, when you calculate the quantum potential and every point in space, it goes to infinity. And they're like, well, we can't do that. So let's get rid of that. And that became then the foundational premise that, well, we're not gonna include that energy. Would you say that really that is the, the most essential shift from the modern physics model to the unified physics model? Exactly. Um, yeah, that's very well said. Um, basically, um, uh, early on, uh, when Einstein wrote relativity, there was a few experiments, uh, uh, Marcuson and Marley experiment that, you know, remove the concept of um, ether that was present before that as a result of Maxwell and others. Um, you know, that had understood that electromagnetic waves propagating in the universe must be, you know, propagation of, of some medium. So space could not be empty if it was propagating waves. And so they had understood that space was full of an energy medium. They had called the ether. Um, and that is how... Uh, Maxwell wrote his equations before they were linearized. And, um, and he, he wrote his equations to describe the electromagnetic field literally as vortices of the ether with little balls in it, with little smaller vortices in it, right? Rotating yeah. around. And, uh, and, um, and he got the right answers. It gave all the right answer for the measurements we were making in laboratory. It was very precise. It was really good. It was a little more complex, but, um, you know, and so, he, so it was correct. But, um, but with the event of general relativity, they basically, and this, is, this has been a big problem in, in physics, is that there was a point in physics where it became acceptable to start doing conceptual models or mathematical conceptual models of things, assuming they were not things. So you, you basically use a thing in your equation, but you say it's nothing. It's just a thing, <laughs> but it's not in the real world. It's just a thing I'm putting in my equation. And this is what space time became. It was a thing right, that they put in the equation, they said, wow, when space, when space time curves, it produced gravity. But don't worry about space time, it's not a real thing, right? Um, and, and, the, and the Michelson and Marley experiments kind of supported that view because it was a bad experiment, right? It was like an experiment that could not measure the ether. I mean, if, if they would have been really lucky, maybe they would have seen it, but the way the experiment was conducted, there's no way they could have measured the ether with that uh, because it's, it's fluctuating at the Planck scale much smaller. It has viscosity, so that means that it's rotating on the same frame of reference as the planet, so they wouldn't see a difference at the surface of the planet, all this. And there was a lot of reasons, right? And Yeah, yeah and now we, we have experiment showing that there is this ether. Yes, there's many experiments with the frame dragging and the frame the dragging satellite. there's the casimir effect the dynamical casimir effect showing that the vacuum is not empty but it got a new name you see so it all got convoluted now it's quantum vacuum fluctuations in quantum theory but in relativity it became space-time so now those things got like separated because space-time was thought to be smooth and quantum theory thought to be granular so they didn't agree with each other and so everything became very very convoluted mm. it, if people are interested and we should can somebody make a note we should add this link in the resource of that um, of that uh, module we should add the link of uh, Frank Wilczek giving a talk called um, the reality of the, the, materiality of the, vacuum. the materiality of the vacuum. Yeah. That That's is an excellent talk. 
It's by a Nobel Prize winner in physics. Is the first high-level physicist in the world that has the nerve to talk about the fact that we should have never removed the ether from theory, that Einstein was wrong to remove it, and that it took him 10 years, but he figured out that it was the wrong thing to do. But by the time he reversed it or tried to reverse it, nobody listened to it. They were happy to have a thing that's not a thing that they called space-time. <laughs> um, and uh, so this whole thing became um, very problematic because space-time being a thing that's not a thing, that is nothing in Einstein field theory explained what the heck it was. Um, and uh, all of a sudden having quantum fluctuation shows up out of uh, shows up out of uh, quantum field theory that was like showed that space time at the quantum scale of sp uh, of you know the quantum scale meaning very fine level was full of energy um, that freaked out everybody because it wasn't like you said just full of energy the equation said there was infinite amount of energy in every point of space time which makes space time warp to infinity in every point. Uh, which I happen to think it is. <laughs> uh, that's why it's all connected through wormholes. Um, and so this, uh, this whole thing became very problematic, has been completely distorted and cut into pieces and isolated from each other. And the result is that most people do not understand the relationship of these pieces together. So forget unifying them. And, um, and, and, and that's been the big issue. Yeah, so it's, it's really been the component that does unify them was Absolutely. removed. That was removed. And from there on, it basically became offshoots trying to go in some, you know, in a direction that could reconnect without any binding theory <laughs> to reconnect and, them all yeah and so modern well, physics has basically kind of in that regard has created its own problems we could say right yeah yeah it's created its own problems and it detached from the reality of reality meaning right. it detached you know all of a sudden it became conceptual and literally, like very famous physicist uh, uh, Richard Feynman, for instance, used to tell his student all the time, you know, shut up and calculate. Like literally it became mm -hmm. this idea that like you can just write math and if the math ha adds up, you're fine, right? You, you don't need to understand, the, you don't have to try to make it like some kind of mechanical understanding of the universe. Some or kind experimental of that, yeah validation well, well no no experimental validation was still present is still present is still there like if meaning like if if you say time space time is curving and you make the equation and you calculate how much it curves in the presence of how much energy and mass and you can verify that by the orbits of the planet you get you say okay we're good and mm -hmm. nobody goes back and say what what the what the hell i was gonna use the <laughs> f word what the hell is space time right it, it's okay that it's right. just math floating in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. you see what i'm saying that, that is the issue mm -hmm. right it, it became acceptable and especially with quantum theory and the double slit experiment the copenhagen interpretation it became as it became acceptable to just write mathematical, mathematical models that have no relationship or context in reality and say, well, if it gives the right answer, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. and Which is what I said about yeah, last week. You know, you can have the right answer with completely the wrong theory, you know, and mm -hmm. you will really misunderstand the universe, right? Like, you know, like geocentric, uh, solar system, you can account for all the movements of the planet and have very high precision of where they're going to be in space and point them in the sky and say, you see, it's right there where I calculated it would be. 
but your solar system looks like a bad hair day until you make it a heliocentric solar system. And then in that case, you know, everything become, becomes simple. You still have the same predictive power, but you got the right model, right? right Which is actually right. not quite right because the sun is moving and you're making spirals which would be more right, you know? Yeah, or it's incomplete, we could say. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. So in, but, in that... But, yeah, the, you, there lies the problem. It's not because you can make a measurement and say, well, I'm getting the right answer, that you have the right model. And certainly if your model has conceptual math, conceptual systems in it, like modeling system that cannot be tied to the mechanics of the universe, how valid is it? How, how, what is it telling you about the universe? Yeah, and so that, that then leads into another aspect that's in module three, which is um, looking at the, the theories of loop quantum gravity, string theory, um, which, you know, string theory especially just became a massively huge and some say highly successful theory without any without any uh experimental validation whatsoever but With no millions and dollars of funding reality yeah and so you're saying it became a, a conceptual path to investigating an idea basically right and um which is valid but if you forget that you've made models or if you don't care that your models have anything to do with reality, which is really the case at this point. Like mm -hmm. people make models, they don't really care if it has any relationship to physics, like really physics. The physical just, universe. Yeah, the physical universe. Like the, mm -hmm. the, it, it, so, so string theory is, is really the, like, like the ultimate, you know, let's just calculate. And, and, and hope that is going to lead us to unification. Right. Uh, and, and so it, this massive effort of thousands and thousands of physicists, billions of dollars, you know, poured into this to find a unified field theory along that very specific direction. Because the first idea is elegant, that, that space and time has teeny strings in it that are vibrating is not that far off. Right, that's what you I was ask about, yeah. Yeah, it's not that far off. The ether theory, you know, it's not, it's not that far off the reality. But then it was written in conceptual math, very complex conceptual math that just went on mostly by mathematicians, you know, physicists, mathematician, which is a field of physics that developed, you mm. know, which, which all of a sudden, like, it, it, you know, it just exploded into excuse the terminology for the string theorists out there, <laughs> insanity, you know? And then it just, you know, and, 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 and what was the result? Not one experimental evidence anywhere because you keep, like the way it's written, there's, there's no hope for experimental evidence, which is convenient, right? It's, it, mm. their strings are too small, they're compactified in too small of a bit, and we can never get there with any experiment on the planet. And so, so we're just going to assume. Can't be proven wrong or right. Right. So we're just going to assume they're there. And then the answer of the theory, right? When you write an equation, hopefully you get one answer and the answer is correct, right? So hopefully that's going on. Or you get a bunch of answers mm. and the answers are correct, right? I mean, if you're doing a class, you know, if you if you're doing a test in mathematics and you you're you're writing a proof, and at the end of the proof, hopefully you get the right answer. Well, in this case, you know, when you get to the end of the proof, you get an answer which says, well, you know, there's approximately ten to the four thousand eight uh, nine hundred forty-eight or approximately to the 5,000, 10 to the 5,000, which is a huge number, immense number, possibilities of how the strings are compactifying, right? So basically you get 10 to the five, what did I say, 500? It's 5,000, right? About, yeah, about the, 
uh, 10 to the 5,000 possibilities. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the possibilities of how the answer can be structured. So this, um, this whole thing becomes kind of a mess. Um, and um, is there anything within those theories that you would say has um, contributed to a greater understanding or have they just gone too far and lost that? Like you said, at the foundation was a good idea. Um, it has, it did. It, mm -hmm. it contributed to the holographic principle. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that it took a really long turn. Um, it confused a lot of people. It's still confusing a lot of people. And, um, but eventually it led, you know, uh, Sutskin and others to formalize the holographic principle in a way uh, with the hoof, in a way that, you know, start to describe fluctuations of the vacuum on the surface of black holes. Now we were getting back towards sanity, towards something, you know. So like string theory initial concept, I think was elegant and had value. The math that uh, it, it just went completely in a whole direction of like mathematical insanity. And then it came back to something that, you know, is much more manageable, like, you know, a quarter of the surface of a black hole is equivalent to its entropy, which mm -hmm. is like, oh, wow. Okay, now, you know, but you can't really attribute that to, quant to string theory. theory. Yeah. It, it's just that strings formalism could be used to output the you know the um, the holographic principle but you don't need strings to do it right i see yeah uh, so yeah, it ask... was some cool stuff but you know, right, they, right but they... a lot of confusion as well <laughs> yeah a lot of confusion i'm curious to ask olivier um who has um gone through deep deep academic study of physics gotten his doctorate um really studying and i don't know your background to say what specific fields but i know you've gone through the the full academic program and studied what we would call modern physics um, very deeply and to then come into a, a a sense that well there's something more there's something that's not quite answering some of the big questions in all of this and then finding in the sims theory and and your initial sense of of making a transition maybe from one framework of understanding to another how that was for you and and um you know how that came about and uh, maybe just move closer again to the mic so we can hear you very well yeah. so uh from my, my perspective uh i was first uh, an applied physicist so I, I wasn't dealing with all this complex equation and because in applied physics usually we use simple equations that we can solve and that we can verify experimentally so i i, I wasn't aware of all this issue with theory, theoretical physics and this kind of stuff and uh, it was very interesting to to look at them and see uh, the history of it because yeah, like Nassim said before, yeah, it's, it's very interesting to, to look at the first ideas and uh, where they, why they wanted at some point to change the, the, their path and to go on a strange way, on a more complex way, just to bury uh, the, their non-understanding non of the physics of the, of the reality. So it seems like when when people doesn't understand what they are talking about, they want to make it very very complex, so it looks like more smart, even if it's not functioning. And uh, string theory is uh, like Nassim said, it's a good example of that. Mm -hmm. And how was it for you when you then came upon the Sims work and and started investigating that? What did that and, tell you? Uh, yeah, with nothing work, the, the really interesting thing is that you can start again uh, 
imagine imagining uh, the the mechanism of the of everything uh, in your head because it's like normal physics uh, that you can experience in your daily life but apply that each scale so it's very yeah it's very easier to yeah to to imagine and to work with because mm -hmm. it's not that abstract uh, abstract right right yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, well, as well, it resolves issues that are not resolved in. Yeah. So uh, you don't have all these paradoxes. And so it's way easier to, to work with. <laughs> yeah. But it still took Olivier a good three years. Yeah, it's been four years now. Four years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because the, the big challenging Part is that you, you need to look at all the physics. And usually an astrophysicist don't look at quantum physics because it's another field, so he doesn't have to look at it. And it's kind of a relief because studying everything is kind of <laughs> very challenging. So uh, it has been a very bad habit for physicists to study only one thing because it's easier. Yes. <laughs> but you, you lose the overview. And the overview is like, uh, most of the time essential, especially when you want to understand precisely what, what's happening. And working with Nassim makes you, oblige you <laughs> to mm. studying everything, to have the, at every time, the overview to, yeah, to understand the world thing. Yes. I, 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 I had to do that over a period of 30 years. And, and so, and this is one of the, that's one of the issue is that, you know, the, the complexity of physics can take a lifetime to study one field and to be able to study, you know, very wide like that, all the field, you have to go really hard for a really long time to understand the details. But since I had done that, um, you know, I was able to feed Olivier, the, you know, the... That's right. <laughs> the abstract version, yes, <laughs> which you were happy to get. <laughs> um, and, and so, um, and then Olivier was able to study it. In many cases, Olivier was like, no, it can't be like that. And then I would say, yes, it is. And then he would like go study it and then go, oh my God, it is like that. And, you know, yeah. and yeah. so it's been, it's been a great journey. And uh, and the great thing about Olivier is that he's um, he's genius uh, at um, you know seeing um, mechanical functions or, or physics in his head and then applying it to mathematics and to like you know work out the math and see you know if if the conceptual notion has um, as um, some foundation in the if it adds up in the mathematics and so you know for the last four years we've been going at it and you know Olivier is very honest with his uh with his exploration and so it's been adding up and adding up and adding up and looking good and uh now we have something really really powerful yeah I, we're, we're both blown away how yeah. well it adds up. I saw a comment go by where people were saying, well, you know, you guys are not really going through the, the, the module and it's kind of all over the place. Can you guys stick to the <laughs> module? And it's like, oh, sorry. That's well, I mean, that's not the purpose of these particular sessions to go through the module specifically, right. uh, which I said right. at the beginning. It's more just have an overview and get a sense of the, the reason that we include these modules in the program sort of the, right. the premise of why it's important to, to understand something uh, like the, the modern physics theory so that when we get to the next module, module four, uh, which is about unified physics, when you get there, it's very helpful to understand some of the foundations of physics, at least conceptually. And for most of us at most conceptually, like me, I'm not a technical person. <laughs> it's more about getting the concepts and then carrying it forward into the program. Um, and I thought maybe just for a, a minute, we'd bring William on as well. William, if you might come on and unmute yourself, thanks. Yeah, um, William Brown is our resident 
biophysicist and uh, has been also working with Nassim for many years. And, um, and William actually has a course called uh, The Big Questions, and one of our elective programs that you can sign up for as well in the Residence Academy. And um, I thought, William, if you could just speak for just a few minutes about in relation to modern physics and the idea of the big questions that have been unanswered for so long. In, in our course, we're really looking to help answer those questions. And in the theory, of course, that's, that's happening quite a bit. So if you could just speak for just a few minutes about the importance of addressing the big questions in physics and how that relates to the problems in modern physics. Yeah, so uh, the big questions course is looking at what are, are arguably some of the biggest questions in science as a whole. And of course, that starts with physics, uh, because as the basis, as the, the fundamental science, uh, that's where some of the most uh, elementary questions reside. Uh, so questions relating to uh, cosmogenesis. Um, where did everything come from? How did it all start? Uh, was there a beginning? Will there be an ending? Pretty big question. Uh, you know, to questions of uh, biology. You know, um, how did life start? Where did living things come from? And then retrospectively, how does that play back into the mechanics and physics of the universe. Uh, then what about consciousness? Uh, the, this property that living things seem to have. Again, big questions. Where, what is consciousness? Where does consciousness come from? Um, and, uh, you know, these are uh, in science that have almost been taboo subjects, you know, su subjects that you don't address uh, you, you know, um, kind of going back to that, just shut up and compute type uh, myopic approach. Um, but also uh, in part because it seemed that they were questions that would lead to just uh, inexplicable uh, uh, situations. You know, they, they were just riddled with paradoxes. You know, a good example of that is uh, the fine tuning problem. You know, uh, how is it that the universe appears just right for life, um, you know, given that everything should have just a underlying randomness? How do you get this amazing organizational synergy and complex ordering that is necessary for, for life? Uh, and, you know, so these were all these are all paradoxes in modern science and, and particularly in modern physics, uh, it, you know, they, they don't seem to have any tractable approach to answer them. One of the things about Nassim's unified physics approach is that it resolves those paradoxes. In particular, it, it, it resolves those paradoxes at that fundamental level. You know, if you're just in modern physics, uh, you know, if you're asking uh, how did the universe begin, um, you know, what is time, you know, these don't have answers. Um, but, uh, and we'll see this as we get into module four, when you start to look at the concepts that are coming out of the unified physics, things like space memory, you know, that begins to explain, okay, what is time? And uh, you, you begin to find an approach to resolve problems like uh, the fine tuning problem uh, because you find, well, okay, there's this structure and informational aspect of space itself. Maybe that is offering a non-random function to the mechanics of the universe so that you can get uh, this order and organizational synergy that increases over time. Uh, you, and you get in a universe uh, that, that evolves and develops uh, to form these complex arrangements of matter that we call life. 
Um, and, and as well, you know, qu questions related to uh, the Big Bang, you know, the be uh, cosmogenesis, the beginning of the universe. And, and what we're able to do with the unified physics approach is weave all of that together. And uh, as Olivia and Asim were saying, it, it, the beautiful thing about it is that it doesn't require this complexity that perhaps would be presumed that you'd need to explain these big questions. Because at the heart of it, it it's simple and it's elegant and really an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old can understand it. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, so to, and so you know to build this complexity that you see that is the universe, you can do that. It, it, that is accomplished because it's built on simple principles. Yeah, you know, even simple geometric foundational principles. Uh, and, and so you know, the, the big questions course is exploring that, and it's really it, it, it's a continuation. It's it's taking that next step from. Module three, module four, and even module six. So we'll see. Yes. Yeah. Going deeply into some of the subjects covered in the main course. Mm -hmm. Thanks, William. Thanks for that overview. And and yeah. you can see how it um, uh, it relates to the the modern physics having, as we said earlier, basically gone in, uh, into offshoots and not and and removed that which allows it to all bind together into a unified theory. And when that's put back in, those big questions have a much greater chance of being <laughs> answered, which is, which is what's happening. So um, yeah, so it's, it's a fantastic course and it's a, one of the electives that you can choose to, um, to purchase and go into at any time uh, in the academy. Right. It's probably it's a good great. idea to go through the uh, unified science course first and right. that's the free one that was is available now. Do that first, and then go into something like that course. Yeah, and then, you know, I it, so you know, just to go back to the course a little bit, like you know, uh, when we talk about, re, uh, I was excited actually to write about Newton. Um, some of that module actually we have to give credit to Adam Apollo wrote a bunch of it. I yes. I rewrote a bunch of it. Um, you know, um, but basically, you know, and, and it was great. Um, it's just, I needed to be a little bit different because of the studies I've made, uh, especially in the history of physics. Um, you know, that's not so well known. So if you've been educated in the college on physics, in physics today, you might not know, but like, for instance, a good, a great example is Newton. You know, when people think about Newton, they think about Newton laws. They think about the source of the concepts of mechanics. So I just wanted to touch on this, you know, very lightly, but I just wanted to touch on this, that like this concept, first of all, like if you actually read Newton's private writings and if you look at the history, especially since um, the, his private notes were uncensored in the last few, uh, in the last decade, um, you know, the, which are still not well known that actually is, his personal notes were censored and that they were uncensored, like they were brought to the public and, you know, that give the completely different picture of who Newton was because everybody think about Newton, they think about mechanic physics, very reductionist physics, and so on. He, they think of him as the father of reductionist physics with Descartes and, um, you know, um, and Cartan. Uh, but, but basically, um, this is just not the case. Um, but not only that, is that, you know, people, when they, when you say the mechanic, when I say this, I shock people. I say, okay, well, you know, the universe is mostly just straight up mechanics. And people say, oh my God, you know, you just taken all the magic out of the universe. Like you just killed all my spiritual and aspiration. And, you know, like I didn't think of you as a reductionist. Did you actually say that, you know? And, I, and, I, and it's, it's funny because it's like, um, because 
mechanics doesn't mean that it's linear. Doesn't mean that it's um, that it's um, boring. It, it, mechanics is actually completely nonlinear. It is one of the like spin is one of the hardest thing to describe in physics. It's very very complex. Like in fact, gyroscopic effects um, and Coriolis effect and gyroscopic effects have not been so well understood in in mechanics. Everybody would think we know this stuff, like. You know, but this problem with frame of reference, this problem, like, um, and and as well in in um, in uh, char in charge uh, in in um, in um, in energy uh, mechanics. Uh, you know, like you have like uh, things like um, monopolar generator and so on that like you just spin a magnet makes power. You know, like you know relative to what you know like and so you know there's all kinds of things but basically um uh, mechanics is doesn't mean it's boring <laughs> uh, mechanic means that actually you know if you don't understand something in the universe and that leads to as well some of the interpretation later and i'll get back to newton it doesn't mean that it's magic. It doesn't mean it's like quantum magic and you can just write math that makes quantum magic come out right and that the universe is some kind of mess at the quantum level that's not understandable and you should just shut up and calculate. That is not the case, folks. You know, that was a departure that was horrible in physics. When they agreed, okay, we're gonna drop all mechanical system and because we can't understand them, not because there was lots of evidence that there is no mechanical system. There's lots of evidence that there's mechanical system, that angular momentum is really happening at the quantum level, that all these things. But instead, it's like, well, this is just so mind boggling. I can't think about it. So I'm just going to write math that just bypass all this. And, you know, and so basically, you know, when you look at Newton, Newton uh, was an alchemist. Newton was a very spiritual person. Newton, you know, actually in his writing, in his, phys in his private writing, Newton had figured out that there was subatomic particles in the atom. He had figured out that these subatomic particles were singularities. He had the concepts. Uh, you know, he, he had, you know, he had something so much more powerful than uh, than what was published, which was literally little notes that his students found around his desk and his apartment, and, you know, which happened to be the laws of motions and you know the uh, uh, laws of conservation and so on, and you know that for him were just kind of like kind of approximation approach to get to somewhere more profound. And these notes got published and became, you know, but actually um, Newton was a much deeper thinker than all this. And to associate him with mechanical physics is just, is just fundamentally wrong, like very, very fundamentally wrong. And, and it's really sad that it is pro he is portrayed like that in most history books and certainly to students in colleges. And so um, it's very, it, there's magic is mechanics. And, I, and this is why, you know, this is why I've always said, you know, all these para, you know, para everything phenomenon, you know, mm -hmm. and, and spiritual concepts and all this are just physics we haven't understood. This, if, if, you know, the fact that people can have you know, extrasensorial capability to remote view, for instance, something on the other side of the planet they've never been to, which has been completely supported and published in very good journals in, 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 from experiments in, in, in laboratory. Um, you know, uh, the fact that people can do that, which is a fact because it's been measured <laughs> and published in peer reviewed journals, okay, um, it, 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 although it appears like magic and very spiritual and it's wonderful um, to the, that the human mind can do that or the human consciousness can do that, in the context of the mechanics of a unified view of physics becomes understandable. That's what I mean by that. 
like it's the physics we haven't understood is because like if you if your physics equation end up go, telling you that every point in space is connected through micro wormholes and then information is moving across the universe across these wormholes as it's making the mass of everything you see well all of a sudden it makes sense that since you're made out of these things we call atoms that are part of the micro network wormhole of the universe you have access to information that's non-local um so all of a sudden something that looks magical becomes understandable in physics and that's really important that's what newton was looking for mm -hmm. yeah so there's a there's a mechanism to something like remote viewing and it, it makes sense it, yeah or healing and it makes sense that like you said these kinds of phenomena have been shown to be true and and well proven and published papers about it and yet without a foundational theory to explain what's the mechanism for that and so it's it's then it's often just sidelined as a as a scientific field because without a foundational theory and a mechanism uh it's it's pseudoscience or whatever it gets labeled and exactly what's happening now and that's part of the problem with modern physics is that there is no mechanism you could point to in that theory because of the fact that they removed the the idea of space being full and connected and made it an empty vacuum and so right. without that again that unifying component there's no mechanism there's no way to 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 correlate such phenomena in that kind of a model yeah and you don't even have exactly in that context you don't even have a mechanism for you know as william was describing for complex life to emerge you know exactly for <laughs> let alone that know, yeah forget forget spiritual you know events like yeah. remote healing you yeah. don't have a mechanism for one human being to even exist you know yeah. and, or or even things that are well known and well measured for instance not like remote viewing wasn't well measured but um for instance you know um people talk about the placebo effect you know placebo effect people talk about it oh yeah that's just a placebo effect oh yeah that's just a placebo effect like if it's a normal thing like well wait a minute first of all that's like almost 30 and you know correct me if i'm wrong william like i think it's 30 to 50 percent uh can be the placebo effect even in surgery placebo effect where they just open you they don't do anything they close you up and you're good <laughs> you know it's extremely non-trivial you, you know it's, it's like you have to control for the placebo effect the, the fact that people will heal themselves right and so you know of course so people say oh yeah there's a placebo effect it's accepted by all the mainstream it's accepted by all because you can't avoid it because it's not like a one tenth of a percent thing you know it's a huge amount uh, you know 30 to 50 percent of people can self-heal well in the context of a random universe with no organizing structure with no you know field interaction with like where you're just in space as like some kind of space microbe that if that involves some kind of miracle on this planet like um, and, and, and that ha and, and in a random universe that has no, you know, organization. Well, of course, like, how is your consciousness all of a sudden, because you got given a sugar pill telling you it's going to heal you, how did it get rid of your cancer? Right? Like, how, how did that actually happen? Right? So they, but people ignore that question because they don't have a context but in the context of a unified view of course you know every atom is an information you know network that's extracting the holographic mass solution give all the correct answer i just want to say it gives the right correct answer it's not like string theory where it can't be proven it has been measured now you know like the the prediction of the radius of the proton is a prediction that was done by the theory that was measured in an accelerator and that was confirmed and that is now the co data volume for the radius of the proton and so you know this kind of thing like all of a sudden it's like oh yeah so now you know since 
your body is actually an information flow of the quantum field oscillator. Well, you know, if you decide in that information flow that your cells are supposed to do something else than what they're doing, there's a good chance they're going to do it. And, you know, it, it, you might be absolutely unconscious that you're doing it, but because you were told there is this pill and it's going to heal you, guess what? The material world responded to it. And so that's a whole other different, the yes. different. Yeah. Yeah. We can even delve into that a little bit more next week. And then I think, uh, I think in module six, it goes into bit into the, the information network, the space memory network aspect. And we can delve into that a bit more there. It's important, not just for the physicists or the mainstream or the doctors or whatever, it's important for the spiritual community as well, because the tendency is to think, well, it's some kind of spiritual thing that has nothing to do with reality, that has nothing mm -hmm. to do with physics. And that's just as bad. Now you've made mm -hmm. it this, you know, this is another separation. Oh, this is spirituality. It has nothing to do with the physical world. And then the other guys on the other side is like, oh, this is all physical world. It has nothing to do with like consciousness or spirituality or something. And it's just one thing. It's just basically, one thing. basically both fingers are pointing at the other saying it's an illusion. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that doesn't get you very far. It's, it's really, really sad. <laughs> there's still something going on, even though it, Fundamentally, yes, it may be an illusion, but there's still something real happening right now. <laughs> exactly. We are engaged in it. Uh -huh. well, let's do some questions, Nassim. Um, okay. I think just in, in the spirit of uh, the module three modern physics subject matter, there's one from someone named Nuno Macado asking for you to explain the difference between the Copenhagen interpretation and your point of view, your theory. And so if you could just nutshell a little explanation of what the Copenhagen interpretation is and maybe the most important parts that then informed modern physics from there and then how the unified physics theory is addressing some of those, um, some of the issues that came from that. Okay, so, um, you know, um, there, is, there is a very, um, so it, it's, it's a little bit of a long story, I'll try to make it short, but basically, in, red, in, in quantum theory, um, there was an experiment that was done in which, you know, particles are, are shot at a slit, and, um, you know, it came from earlier experiments as well, in which they were trying to understand particle and wave interaction and all this stuff. And um, basically, uh, you know, when they shot the particles at the slit, they got one result on the backboard, on the on the on the um, on the detector that was receiving the particles, which was like dots. And then when they got you know, two slits there, and the slits cannot just be random slits. They have to be in the right proportion and the right dimension and all this, you know, it's not an easy experiment to make. But then, you know, the, the result is that all of a sudden, instead of getting, you know, the particles on the detector in the back, they would get like waveforms, right? They would get interference pattern uh, type of structures that look like waveforms. And they were basically confused. It's like, well, we're shooting particles. How are we getting waveforms? And, you know, they, they, they couldn't understand, like, all of a sudden, the way the particle was like a, a particle and a wave. It appeared that, like, somehow the particle became superposed uh, or it became separate or, 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 or dual and went through two slits and interact with itself to make waves on the other side. And it was like, oh my God, how is this possible? The particles are wave and particles at the same time. This was a very, very critical moment in this history. It was, you know, part of what happened in Copenhagen. I don't know what they were taking, but what happened, whatever they were taking was not good stuff, right? Because what happened is that, 
you know, they eventually said, well, you know, we're going to abandon mechanical concepts of particles and waves in quantum scale. And we're going to just say um, their probability relationship. And this is that this is what led to this whole quantum magic thing. Uh, meanwhile, you know, and there's another part of the experiment where they would put a, a detector to try to figure out which slit the particle went through, you know, trying to catch it, you know. Um, and then if the, if, the, if the measuring device they put in was in the right proportion to the slit, they had this other result where it basically returned to dots. And, and like, so, so then they said, oh my God, when we measure, it changes the outcome. <laughs> and so there are even more loss, like, oh my God, how can that be? And, and this led to the really, you know, sad moment in physics where physical models were abandoned and they said, okay, we can't deal with this, trying to understand its mechanics. It's not mechanical. It's got to be some kind of magic. And, you know, we can only write like, um, you know, basically statistical approximation of what goes on. And particles can be particles and waves at the same time, which led to the statement from Feynman, don't ask questions, just calculate. And, um, and basically, they were able to write mechanical models that kind of work. I mean, they work, they give the correct answer, but it didn't tell you how a particle is a particle and a wave at the same time, which led to this idea that quantum world is so different from the classical world. In physics, classical world is the larger world, right? That it, it, you, you can't understand it. It's completely different and it's magical down there. And you shouldn't try to like think of the quantum world anywhere close to your reality every day. Yet, you know, the piece that's missing there is that all of reality in your large world, in your classical world, is made of quantum things. So where does it stop becoming magical and starts becoming just linear mechanics? Like, I, you know, it's just complete complete insanity folks it's sad it's so crazy and it led to like literally like almost like uh, uh you know uh, how do you call it a personality disorder <laughs> you know like a, you know a, 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 a dual personality problem um you know and um and so basically you know it, but all this time there was this great physicist that was well known at the time, French physicist, Du Boglier, that was there that was saying, hey, wait a minute, I can solve this with fluid dynamics. And because he was an expert in wave um, uh, dispersion and, and wave uh, propagation. And he, he tried to talk to Einstein, he did talk to Einstein and others, um, but uh, they didn't like the idea because it would have brought the ether back. Um, so they went against it because he showed, uh, and then eventually Bohm, so the Boglier and Bohm effect and so on, it was eventually called pilot wave theory, uh, where they showed that actually you can resolve the double slit experiment completely um, just using fluids and eventually I independently, so the question is, how does it relate to the theory? I independently, in my van 30 years ago, figured out, wait a minute, I can solve the double slit experiment with wave in the fluid. Um, but I had no way to do the experiment. Eventually, the experiment was done. And I didn't know that the, the Buglier had resolved it. I thought I had come up with it. And then I was, I realized I was, like I had got beat by you know a few a few uh, a few hundred years no no one you know seventy five years or whatever it was and it, and but basically you know the, the they took a back of um, fluid silicone liquid and they put little silicone beads on it and two slits and shot the beads and they got all the effects because guess what. When a particle is moving, that's how I figured it out in my van. 
when the particle is moving, you can assume it's in the vacuums of, of that space is empty and it's not having anything to do with the particle. Or, you know, that the ether is being affected and maybe the particle itself is made out of the ether. And so basically, just like a boat going on the ocean, when it moves, it makes waves. So of course, it's a particle and a wave at the same time, right? It, it makes waves when it moves in the ether. And then, of course, the waves go through the second slit, interferes with the, the particle, make waves on the backboard. Like all of a sudden makes sense. When you put an instrument to measure it, the instrument makes wave, interferes with the waves that the particle are making and makes a third effect. All of a sudden, everything is affecting everything because we're all bathing in the same field. This is called um, pilot wave theory. And you can actually go to YouTube and see some of these experiments. They were able to output, you know, quantum tunneling. They were like all the things we see from the double slit experiment, you can replicate with fluids, showing that basically the particle is moving in a field. And, um, you know, in the context of the unified view of physics, that field is the source of matter, forces, and energy that we see in every day, and including eventually, like William was saying, the construction of biological system and consciousness. So it's, um, it's awesome that, like, you know, you just have to add the field in and then you resolve the equations that are already there. And all of a sudden it's like, whoa, look at that. It gives all the right answers. And, and all of a sudden you get rid of magic in physics, which should not be there, right? And you understand the true mechanics of creation. Oh, um, re relating to the, the pilot weight theory, there's a question regarding how, how do you explain the, the hidden variables? You know, and so, um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, your approach addresses this in part because you do have non-local connections via that infinite curvature of space-time, those wormhole connections, but also e even um, uh, Bohm's uh, uh, pilot wave theory, you, you know, it, it has non-locality at, at a global scale. And so you can still have hidden variables, uh, but how do you explain the, the, the hidden variables? Yeah, the, you mean by the non-locality, um, you know, interaction of particle and so on? Yeah, yeah, yeah because, um, you know, you've got Bell's theorem, yeah. that, you know, it's supposed to show that, you, you know, the, these quantum interactions Correct. Uh, can't be explained by any hidden variables. Uh, which I, I guess in a sense means that, you know, your particle didn't have a property until it was measured or right of that nature. Right, exactly. So basically the, the, the Swerninger cat in the box, you know, that uh, is alive and dead at the same time in superposition. This is where the, you know, the Copenhagen interpretation leads to is like all of a sudden the, this create, because you have something that's nonlinear, that is producing, you know, um, that's showing that information is non-local, um, the, the, the tendency has been to think that because we can't figure it out locally, um, that it actually doesn't exist until it is measured locally. <laughs> it's like, and you know, there's a famous saying, from Einstein, because Einstein thought that was a whole bunch of baloney, and he was right. Um, but you know, the because he was walking with a physicist, and I I can't remember who it was. It, um, I can't remember. It was a physicist or a mathematician um, uh, in the, in the gardens of Princeton, and he um, he said, do you, "So so so, if I understand this right, do you really believe?" that if you don't turn around to look at the moon, it's not there, right? <laughs> it's like, uh, no, you know, of course not. There's a frame, there's a problem there. It's, it's not like things don't exist if you don't observe them. The universe is not 
human centric. It doesn't require the human to make a measurement in order to come to existence. It doesn't really give a shit if the humans are around. Consciousness is not localized in humans. There's consciousness everywhere. If the cat is in the box, and it's in state of superposition and which is alive and dead until you open the box and observe its state. Well, guess what? What happened to the flea? What is the observation of the flea on the cat irrelevant? What about the microbes in the box? What about their observation? Is that irrelevant? You know, there's, there's all sorts of problems with the frame of reference, but, it, but, but, Guess what? You can still, you know, and I'm I'm not saying I'm being crass a little bit. I it just, you know, it's kind of drives me crazy. But you know, it's just that like if you think about it clearly, you know, you can have a fluid that has um in the case of a super superfluid that has um uh, for instance, you know, interaction uh at a distance, if you have you know, um, uh, wormhole interaction, you know, black hole interaction, singularity, meaning that each part of the fluid is singular. It has, um, it has curvature uh, towards infinity, towards singularity in each point. So you have a fluid, but it's not, well, it's actually like a normal fluid because the, lumen, the normal fluid is made of atoms, which have, you know, like, you can't really divide it, but basic, basically what I'm saying is not because it's in a fluid dynamics function that it has all of a sudden it lose, you know, those variables that we have been able to measure, which has to do with the entanglement and, you know, uh, spooky action at a distance, um, which, uh, so, so you can have both. You can have, you know, the fact that space is full of this energy and the fact that this energy is made of singularities that have, you know, um, non-local interaction, that is they're connected through wormhole across the whole grid, meaning that the whole grid is, is connected. This is why our equation with the standard model of quantum physics give somewhat the right answer because it, it appears like the information is unknown until it's observed. It's not that. It's just that the interaction of the information locally is non-local across the whole thing, right? Across the whole universe, across the whole multiverse. And because you can't compute that, you know, to you, it looks like it just appeared non-locally from random function, but actually it's highly coordinated across the whole, the flea observation inside the box is considered by the whole thing. It, the whole thing is, you know, is, is computing reality continuously as the whole. And, the, and because we can't measure that, we can't, uh, or we can't uh, compute that. It appears to us to be random and, and local, you know. Great. I think that covered the subject. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a deep subject. It's a deep subject for sure. And it did cover it. And, and it's, you can see there's a direct relationship between a concept that couldn't be explained or an observation, I should say, that couldn't be explained in a, in a model that had limitations just inherent in it that then became uh, conceptualized in an abstract way and persisted for a long time. And right. Then uh, when you look at it from another perspective that includes a field dynamic that would exhibit the same kind of behavior and suddenly it makes sense. In, and like Olivier said, it's all much simpler uh, when you can, when you actually have a perspective, a frame of reference that that um, allows it to make sense, whereas the prior right. interpretation, which was an interpretation literally, uh, did did not have that. So, right, yeah. Well, let's see, um, Olivier, did you see any questions? I don't know if you're looking at questions as well. Did you see any that are that you'd like to have this answer or? 
Um, there's so many questions here. It has implications, you know, even for consciousness. And like when you think of yourself, you know, to bring it back to people, when you think, you know, my consciousness is in my brain and it's, you know, it's inside me and nothing outside of me is, you know, and what's inside me. Well, what's inside you is 99.9999999% space, you know. What you're calling you is a point, it, point zero 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 of something, right? And that something, when you look closely, it's a, an electrostatic field that's oscillating, uh, that we call a particle, like a proton or electron. And so, basically, when you realize that whole that thing is just a field that you're interacting with, and it's non-local. Oh my God, you can have a lot of fun. <laughs> you can have a lot of fun. You know. Olivier, you found some good questions? Yeah, there are some questions about the space memory network and the C world that now C world that now we can talk about in physics. <laughs> the C word. Okay. Um, yeah, the space I mean actually William can talk about that as well in at length. Um but yeah, we'll, you go, wanna... we'll, we'll go into that more when we talk about module six, I believe. You, you know, what, what's very much related to that, and I've seen a couple of questions, is uh, the holographic physics. You, you know, so you, you're using this a, a holographic approach and you're outputting solutions to quantum gravity. Uh, but, you know, on the one hand, there's a little bit of confusion. What is holographic physics what, what, what does that mean you know uh, i think that especially coming from the mainstream it gets confounded with this idea of a that the universe is really two-dimensional and we're projections of that and you know, that's certainly not really the approach you're taking you, you, your holographic approach is more the information content of a surface horizon uh, uh, and, and also holographic properties like the, the whole is contained in every one point um, but, you know, how, how is your holographic approach even different from kind of that mainstream idea? Yeah, physics? Uh, that's a good question because, you know, that's the, the, the problem you run into is that um, the holographic principle, as you know, was, became popular uh, about 15 years ago or 12 years ago or something when the when Hawking lost the bet with um, uh, Sutskin, um, that um, and Duhoof and those guys, that um, you know that information could be lost in a black hole. It was thought that the information that fell into a black hole was lost, and you know that uh, it basically violated the laws of uh, quantum physics that said that no information. Could be lost meaning that it had to be conserved and um you know so the quantum physicists start to uh you know started a war with you know hawking uh which was an astrophysicist and you know he and there was uh this big debate uh, it was a nice kind of war nobody shot at each other or luckily um but um basically um eventually they from, and I mentioned earlier, from, you know, string theory that, you know, approaches and all this there and from what was done by Bekenstein earlier and then eventually the hoof and all this, the idea that there is a fundamental bit of information at the quantum scale, at the Planck scale, that um, that information, when it falls into a black hole, actually is recorded on the surface of that black hole as a holographic bit of information about everything that has gone into that black hole and so that the information is not lost and then so that that was great because it was actually a sensitive like a a, a first start to um, to relating uh, real physics right which is the t physics of thermodynamics because it gives the correct answer for the entropy of a black hole, for the temperature of a black hole, right? So it, it, to information theory and starting to think about the Planck field 
right? As being something that produces real effects, right? That it's not just a kind of crazy thing that's in quantum field theory and that just like you can't ignore it. It actually made, so it was really important. But the problem is that it was written in two-dimensional physics, uh, which is, again, we've made models a very long time ago, not by the same guy, that, you know, we write physics on Cartesian planes and two-dimensional planes and all this, and then we forgot we did it. So guess what? The result is that physicists start thinking, oh, my God, maybe the universe, the 3D universe, as if there was anything else, right? Maybe the 3D universe is the result of some 2D surface projecting a holographic set of information um, that makes up our universe. And this made headlines. You probably saw it on the cover of magazines. Is our universe a holographic universe projection of a 2D uh, surface and all this stuff? as if there was such a thing as a 2D surface. <laughs> Even in the theory itself, that surface would have to have the thickness of a Planck <laughs> oscillator. It would not be. So, it, you know, and, and there, there's no such thing in the universe as a two-dimensional plane. So, uh, you know, I was, I, was, I was well on my way to coming to similar conclusion, but in geometry. And I, I so of course, you know, I, I was exploring, I had written already the, what I call the Schwarzschild uh, proton solution. And I, I, had the, I had considered inside the proton all the Planck vacuum interaction of the field, right? I, I had clearly put the ether back in you know, understood that quantum field theory and vacuum fluctuation was the ether. And I had put that back into the proton and I had got the right answer for the strong force, for the force that the proton acts on each other and all this. And I was very excited. And then I'm like, wait a minute, they're, mix they're missing the volume. So I said, okay, well, you know, I, and, you know, I was missing something in the, in the Schwarzschild solution, which was as well the, the, um, the rest mass of the proton. It was outputting the strong force, but not the rest mass of the proton. And so I was like, oh, and you know, I mean, this took years of working and this stuff. And then eventually I realized, wait, you know, it turns out, I mean, after all the physics I wrote, it turned out that like, the volume, if I had Olivier then, I might have found it earlier, but it, it, it turned out that the volume of the Planck oscillators relative to this surface, so how much information is able to go across the surface, is more, it, 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 you know, produces the mass of the system. And, you know, I'm like, wow, it gives the right answer for black holes, it didn't give the right answer for proton. And then all these constants emerge and now we're like scaling it to the whole thing. And, the, and so um, that's the difference. It's like, I didn't go for a 2D surface. I, I, mm, I stayed yeah. into the reality of our universe. Right. <laughs> yes, that's an important aspect. And that's a good example, I think, of um, what we would refer to as the shift of uh, perspective and frame of reference from what has traditionally been the the approach of modern physics as we call it and making the shift to uh, a model that can be more unified or be unified not even more but be unified so yeah i think we just have a few more minutes nisim and um we can take a few more questions maybe oh uh, well one more <laughs> one more <laughs> i was thinking uh, if if you would be okay with this one um our friend christiana el Trayan was asking you know, what, how do you see the world in 20 years? And I think from the perspective of what we're discussing today, we've had a history of science and physics and the applications of physics that have informed our current state of the world and, and progressed us to this point. And we're really looking at and, and talking about a, a, a real paradigm shift of understanding as we talked about in the last two sessions, you know, the worldview shift, the scientific shift of understanding that is 
informing our science now and will and is informing our technologies and the applications of that science. And so if you would just take a, a few minutes to say, okay, well, with that in mind, making that sort of a shift right now in our world, what might that look like in, in the next 20 years? Well, it, if, well, we're making that shift and you know part of what's going on in the world right now is actually helping us make that shift it's really important it's kind of breaking down some of the structures that needed to be breaking broken down to expose some of the stuff that's going on in the world that's not necessarily serving us and you know it's very important and and as well some of the experiments that are being done by inventors are re-emerging as well um what it looks like for the next 20 years is remarkable is remarkable this will you know if it's if it's delivered on time to the public this will you know um and is becoming the mainstream very quickly um and um and what it will do is that it will change our relationship to the universe very fundamentally change our relationship to technology to energy um, you know, in that module, we talk about E equals MC square. Well, M is unknown in that equation. That means that E is unknown. We don't know why the speed of light is going to speed of light. All these things start to be understood in the holographic mass solution and the unified view of physics. And then all of a sudden, you understand where energy comes from. It comes from that fundamental field, you know, of information that that ether, now it becomes clear how to engineer devices to extract energy from that field. All of a sudden you align your world and you align your technology to the, tech, to the fundamental mechanics of creation. All of a sudden like you're working with nature instead of working against nature. And mm -hmm. that just changes everything from like energy production, all of a sudden you have a non-polluting source of energy anywhere you are in the universe. You have an infinite amount of it. You don't need resources. You don't need to burn coal. You don't need to collide atoms. You don't need to like, you know, you just extract it from the structure of space. You, uh, you have um, gravitational control. You're able to fly off the surface of your planet, live in the universe wherever you want. You can live in the solar system. You can live in the galaxy. I mean, you know, all of a sudden, your world completely transformed. This is one of the largest transformation. You know, the, the first large transformation our world saw technologically is we learned about electromagnetic fields and learned mm -hmm. how to control them, right? Everything you have today is based on this, right? And then, you know, now this next step is we're learning what gravity truly is, right? Which is... Einstein was correct, it's curvature of space-time. However, space-time is not some, you know, theoretical model of something. It's actually a thing. It's called the, it's called the vacuum fluctuation or the ether, whichever you want to call it. And when it, and it, when it curves, it's because it, there's something spinning. That's what we call mass. We, and we actually have now these mathematics. And then and, and when we apply them, all of a sudden now we have control over gravity. We're not no longer stuck to our planet. We have access to almost infinite amount of resources because we can go around the solar system, the galaxy, to all this. We have infinite amount of energy. Our world is completely different. And it becomes very small very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. And the unification of humanity becomes very obvious, right? Mm -hmm. Because all of a sudden, viewed from space, it's not hard to see that there's not really any line dividing all of the continents, you mm. know, and that, you know, we're a little teeny ball in space flying with a bunch of microbes on it, we call people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, um, and so the, the perspective, the change of consciousness, everything changed. Everything yeah. changed fundamentally. And so uh, the next 20 years are going to be remarkable. I, and I'm so, I'm so happy to be here to experience it. Well, we're happy you're here too, because you're driving a lot of that, <laughs> that <laughs> happens. So it's a good thing. Wow. But uh, yeah, and, and the shoulders of giants. The the really profound thing you're saying, uh, 
relative to Christiana's question is we're talking about in the next 20 years and, and it's not a far-fetched statement um, at all because the, the, the theory is becoming clearer every day. It's sensible and then it's applicable because it's related to the mechanics of the universe. Mm -hmm. And also we know that numerous technologies have been developed and are being developed for the energy extraction and for gravity control, you know, and when we make those kinds of shifts, literally every aspect of the human experience changes our, you know, when you have the ability to extract energy from space in an unlimited abundance, then the idea of what an economy is, an economic model, completely changes because it's no longer based on scarcity and competition and win-lose. And so every aspect changes and, and it it's at hand now. And, um, you know, there's a little bit of a wrestling match still going on <laughs> in the dynamics of the, the human family here as to how it's going to go. Um, right. And yet uh, we know, and I, I feel confident that it's actually going to make a shift. And when it does, it'll happen very quickly. And like we even have seen with everybody not driving cars, whole cities are becoming free of the pollution in a matter of a week. And so when you, when you obsolete the burning of fossil fuels, which is already possible, uh, just electric vehicles and the, the advancement of battery technologies solves that problem. Of course, you have to generate the electricity and then we have the technologies that will solve that problem as well then the environment will very quickly restabilize and, and balance. And you, like you said, we'll come into a harmony with nature and it will happen yeah. in the blink of an eye from an evolutionary perspective. Exactly. And yeah. people need to know all that we need is already there. Like the knowledge, the technology, all this stuff, it's already there. We just, like, it's emerging. It's, it's been emerging. People are saying, well, you've been saying this for a while. Like, yeah, well, you know, you know, considering the evolutionary perspective of a galaxy, you know, it's not been that long that we are, you know, that, <laughs> and so we had to overcome a lot to get this kind of technology out and it's on its way. And actually, you know, there's a great opportunity now because there's a huge transformation happening around the planet. And it can only come out when the consciousness and the awareness and the information flow of the vacuum field is in the right place for the social structure, mm -hmm. the morphogenetic field of the planet to emerge. So every one of you is a participant in making that's that right. possible. Yeah, and allowed to flow freely through the system. Well, that's right. a great way to, to celebrate Earth Day today with that perspective. And yes. that's probably the most great gift we can give to our planet here and to each other and nature and on beyond out into the universe is making that shift and really that's going to be what fulfills the vision of earth day that was started 50 years ago today wow so great celebration i also wanted to just say before we close that um the french version french language version of the unified science program is now online and um olivier is is uh, heading up that um that study and will be offering these kinds of sessions um, I think on a monthly basis as well. And tomorrow actually at the same time, 12 noon Pacific time is uh, the first of these kinds of sessions to introduce the program for six weeks in French. And uh, so that's really exciting for, for all of us and especially for the French speaking community out and around the world. And uh, tomorrow I'll be a guest on that uh, first uh, session. So I'm looking forward to that with Olivier. Um, and um, we'll be here again next week for uh, the next module, which is module four, the big one, unified physics. This is where uh, we, we really go into what, just what we're talking about. You know, when you understand the nature of the field and you include that which unifies it, what comes out of it. And so uh, that's what that module really goes into. Um, so look forward to that for next week. And in the meantime, everybody stay safe, stay well, take good care of each other, stay in your heart, stay in your compassion, really be you know, careful in how we're relating with each other because it's a very stressful time 
uh, in many ways. And it's important to maintain our sense of balance and really this kind of optimism that we're experiencing here today. It really helps us a lot. So thank you, Nassim and Olivier and William and Penny and Jamie and everybody for coming here today and joining us in this session. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, everybody. It's great. Happy Earth, Earth Day. And until next week, may the vacuum be with you. <laughs> As always. As always. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you.